Hello everyone, it is Friday and you have test day today. This is going to be just a real quick review going over the concept map in your guys' note packet um, before hopefully you take your test. Um, I've got Jeffrey snoring on the chair behind me and Penny wanted to show you her new haircut. I was going for um, this look of a dog I saw on Instagram the other day called Finn in his wig. He's a spaniel like Penny, um, but her little top hair is not quite long enough to uh, quite get this bang situation. So we're going to keep working on it, Penny. Grow it out here. Things we do while we're bored. Giving the dog a haircut. All right. So um, just filling out the concept map here real quick. So first off here, our um, unit 13 respiratory system. Um, we have our major main organs. So think about the, the passageways that air flows through on its way into the lungs. Uh, we call these the conducting passageways before they actually hit the alveoli. So you should be breathing in through your nose um, in the nasal cavity first. Uh, lots of good reasons. Um, and this whole upper respiratory area um, does this for you, but it warms well, I'll get to that in a second. It's on the functions list. Um, but you don't want to be a mouth breather, right? It dries your air out. Your pharynx, that's the back of the throat, what you normally think of as the back of your throat um, before air gets to the voice box, which is your larynx. And um, the hole in the middle of the larynx, there's not really good space for this, but you could sort of squeeze it in between the numbers. There's the glottis. And the glottis is the hole, the opening um, in between those vocal folds of your larynx. And then um, you've got your trachea, oftentimes called the windpipe. You can feel, even if you put your hand right here and take a deep breath in, you can feel air rush by. Um, it's got those rings of cartilage that keep it open. And then it branches into the bronchi. Um, and bronchioles from there, the smaller ones. But once it reaches that last step there after the bronchi and the bronchioles, um, we are now into the respiratory passageways where we actually have the exchange of gases occurring. So our functions of our respiratory system is that it warms the air as you inhale. We have lots of blood vessels in your nose. This is why we get bloody nose very, very easy is because we have blood vessels um, right, right up next to our membrane, um, mucous membranes of our nose. It warms your air. Um, it also is there to filter nose hairs and all of the cilia and the mucus is meant to trap substances in order to um, keep bad stuff from coming out. It also humidifies, it adds moisture to the air as well. So there's moisture being added. So by the time it gets to your lungs, it's hopefully not too dry. And then eventually there at the very bottom, the alveoli is actually where we have the actual gas exchange occurring. Um, the other thing, a uh, few other things inside these nasal passageways are your sinuses. Your sinuses do make mucus as well, um, but it is, one, it lightens your skull because it makes your skull bones um, a little bit lighter. But two, um, it allows for resonance, and so you have the echoey sound of your voice um, as you speak through your mouth and like your whole face and your skull. When you are sick and those sinuses are clogged with mucus, you then experience sort of that more um, uh, not so resonance of a sound. So sort of that kind of nasally clogged sound that your voice gets if you're sick. All right. Okay. So down here to the bottom, the different events of respiration. So we that was sort of our little slide that kind of came down at an angle, the page of notes, all the different things that are happening. So first off, regular oral breathing in and out, okay, um, from your lungs, we call that pulmonary ventilation. And that's why the things that help you breathe are called ventilators. One thing that um, the world is in crisis for right now, uh, if you've been paying attention to the news. External respiration, this is when gas exchange is going from 
my respiratory passageways and into the alveoli, those sacs. So that exchange of gases in my lungs, the pulmonary circuit area is my external respiration. The gas transport then is the next step. So how does it move through my body? And we talked about where blood is found, um, or sorry, carbon dioxide and oxygen are found in what forms. We'll go through those. And then internal respiration. And so this is when finally my circulatory system is dropping off those gases, oxygen, um, at my actual systemic tissues, at my systemic capillaries, as well as my systemic cells, my systemic body tissues, and dropping off that. Um, and that's all there is for 14, so we'll end it there. I'm going to jump down to the next screen and cover the rest. There is another type of respiration you learned about in biology. I didn't talk about it very much, but the whole reason we need a respiratory system to begin with is because of our cellular respiration. And as you know from bio, um, cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria, and this is where we require oxygen. It's the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. Um, it accepts electrons so that you can make ATP and that your cells can do their regular thing. That's the whole reason for this entire process is to get that oxygen to your mitochondria so they can work and function as they need to. <clears throat> All right, so the things we already filled out are already up there um, for you. So going back to the beginning here with pulmonary ventilation. All right, so we basically have two different phases. We've got the inhale and the exhale of pulmonary ventilation, inspiratory or expiratory um, to inspire or expire, inspire, inhale, expire, going out, exhale. Um, <clears throat> let me briefly go over those muscles that are involved in that. When you inhale, your external intercostals, they expand your rib cage. And very, very importantly, when your diaphragm, it kind of sits like this when it's um, relaxed. When it contracts, it flattens and pushes down. And this whole thing of an inhale increases the volume inside your lungs. It becomes less than the atmospheric pressure around you and then air rushes in. Nothing fancy, it's just pressure going from high to low. When I exhale, Passively, I just relax all those muscles. If I want to force out <sighs> as much air as possible, I'm contracting my ab muscles as well as squeezing my internal intercostals together to make my rib cage a little bit smaller. <clears throat> okay. The internal intercostals help with the exhale. External intercostals help with the inhale. The I and E's don't go together on this one, unfortunately. Be easy to remember that way. All right, so when we are breathing and we're controlling these muscles, we have our brain, very important breathing centers of our brain doing that, the medulla and the pons. And the main way that it knows how often, how quickly you need to breathe is by checking the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, um, those two levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide, I want you to circle on your page here. Your body cares way more about your CO2 levels, at least your brain sensors care way more about the CO2 levels than they do the oxygen, which is weird because we know that we want oxygen in our body. Here's the main reasons why. When carbon dioxide is in your bloodstream, it will act as an acid and we know that acids lower your pH, right? Making it again a smaller number. Um, but that acid um, can lead to acidosis in your body. So we wanna make sure when we're breathing, inhaling, exhaling, you think of it a lot about getting the oxygen in, but your body cares about getting rid of its carbon dioxide. Um, so when you exercise, okay, your muscles are working out, you are using more of that mitochondria to make ATP energy, so you require more oxygen, but you're producing CO2 from that entire process. And that CO2 is a poison. So not only when I increase my respiratory rate because I'm working out, 
I will also um, need to get rid of more CO2. Now this is where hyperventilation comes into play. When somebody is hyperventilating, it's because your brain thinks you are in a fight or flight situation. Now, if you were getting chased on the street and your fight or flight, in this case flight system kicked on, everything would be doing as it should because you're using your muscles to run away from whatever, kind of the lion that's chasing you down the street, um, you are going to be using more muscles, right? And you're producing more CO2 and you'll be exhaling it more quickly. The problem with hyperventilation is when your brain says we are in a fight or flight situation, but you're not running and you're not using your muscles. This is more of a physiological response to stress. Maybe you're about to do a presentation, okay? You aren't using your muscles when you are hyperventilating. So your respiratory rate increases. You're going to breathe more quickly, just like you would um, if you were running away from a lion. However, because you're not using your muscles, because this is more of a psychological response rather than a physical threat, you aren't making the amount of CO2 that your body thinks it's trying to get rid of. So the problem with hyperventilation is you're losing too much carbon dioxide. And in that case, if I've lost more CO, if I'm losing it, right, more than my muscles are producing it, because right, I'm just sitting there worried and stressed and breathing really quickly, then my pH level is going to increase. Right? I'm not using my muscles, but I'm breathing more quickly. This is going to cause my pH levels to increase because I'm getting rid of all the CO2, but not putting any more in there because I'm not using my muscles. So this is where the breathing into a bag thing works. And you start huffing and puffing either into a hand or a bag because all the CO2 that you're exhaling into that bag, you then inhale and you get your CO2 levels back to the right level. And so um, hyperventilation is a cause in an increase in your pH because you have too little CO2 because you're breathing too fast and not using your muscles. So it's kind of backwards, but your body cares a lot about the CO2 levels. Yeah, we have that um, sensor right on top of our heart that senses oxygen, but um, the cerebral spinal fluid in your brain is constantly checking carbon dioxide levels. And that is what triggers my um, inspiratory and expiratory muscles to um, contract and relax. So chemical is super duper important. But the other things that control my medulla and my pons um, can be, oops, excuse me, um, more physical factors. And so there's a number of things that listed here. An increase in body temperature, okay, is going to actually make you um, breathe more because it might think you're like exercising or working out. Um, obviously, exercise, talking increases your respiratory rate. This is why Mrs. Lloyd always notices when she is lecturing, my heart rate goes up. Um because I need to force more air out of my body uh, as I'm talking, right? Because we have to talk and use air at the same time. Coughing, um, that act of coughing, I don't know if any of you guys have had a cough since we've been out of school, but if you cough a lot, your ab muscles get tired um, and your rib cage gets tired because these are muscles that are cut forcefully flexing to force that air out um, on a forceful exhale. Um, and volition, that word there, it just means by choice. So if I told you, let's do some meditations and take some big deep breaths and some, um, you know, exhales and things like that, that's your own volition, your own choice to take um, deep breaths and things like that. By the way, meditation is a great thing you could do if you're a little bit bored. Um, and then emotional factors too. Okay. Um, if you are laughing or you are crying, you're going to change your respiratory rate too. So there's some physical things that affect it as well. Okay. Moving back up to external respiration. So we're talking exchange of gases in the lungs. So we know that CO2 in this case is leaving, um, in the lungs and oxygen is going to be coming in, but let's talk about how they transport. So when carbon dioxide is moving through your circulatory system, it's traveling in different ways. You should know those percentages of how much is in the plasma, 
how much is on hemoglobin and how much is in um, the plasma as this very important ion called the bicarbonate ion. And remember the enzyme um, anhydrase, uh, carbonic anhydrase is what uh, turns carbon dioxide in water and makes it make carbonic acid. And then um, stripping that hydrogen off turns it into the bicarbonate. Um, doesn't require an enzyme for that piece. But most of the carbon dioxide is transferred that way. Um, oxygen, right, on the other hand, uh, let's see, is going to be transported through hemoglobin, okay? And um, most of it is in hemoglobin, and we call it oxyhemoglobin as it's being transferred in and around the body through hemoglobin. Major, major percentages of it are attached to hemoglobin because we can get it more places more quickly. All right, I do believe that's it that I wanted to go over with you guys. And um, just curious if you guys have any other questions, you let me know. And I hope you guys have an awesome day. Have a good one. Bye.